Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is side one of For the Record program number 414, titled Islam under the Swastika and its Implications for Today. This is being recorded on June 16th of the year 2003. Remember Spitfire, spitfirelist.com is their website. It's equipped with real audio, and within a week or so of the airing of this broadcast, there will be a detailed article-length description of For the Record program 414, meticulously annotated in the For the Record section of the Spitfire website. Note that sister station WFMU-FM is archiving the For the Record programs on real audio. More recent programs are streaming at WFMU.org front slash Dave Emery. Older programs available for download only on real audio at a longer URL linked to both the SpitfireList.com website and to the WFMU.org front slash Dave Emery website. And again, a big tip of the hat to WFMU right across the river from Ground Zero. Uh, thanks to them, the whole For the Record series for all intents and purposes is available for free online. Now, to the subject of this broadcast, what we're going to be doing is taking a look first at some of the history of the collaboration between Islam, or elements of it, Islam would be a better way of putting it. Uh, part of this is the derivation of Islamo-fascism, not to be uh, misunderstood as characterizing Islam as fascist, but there's a very important element both of fascism and of Islam that dovetail, and uh, it is uh, a, an Islamic manifestation of fascism. We're going to be taking a look at Haj Amin al-Husseini, one of the most important figures in the history of fascism and in the development of Islamo-fascism, and we're going to be taking a look at the concept, once again, of the Earth Island, as the German geopoliticians called it, the stretch of land from the Straits of Gibraltar all the way across Europe, the Middle East, uh, the former Soviet Union, the Balkans, China, India, and uh, what is today Pakistan. It's one giant stretch of land with most of the world's land mass, most of the world's population, and most importantly, most of the world's oil. And across the middle of it is a vast stretch of largely Muslim population. In terms of their goals for world domination, the Third Reich looked to uh, ally with these elements of Muslim population in order to conquer the world and also to, uh, and, and in so doing, to cast the British and French out of the Middle East as uh, the colonial occupiers that they were and to uh, annex much of the former Soviet Union, much of which was Muslim, and also to annihilate world Jewry. Today, Islamo-fascism is a very important element of what I call the underground Reich, and what I hope to do in this broadcast is to detail some of the history of Islamo-fascism, in particular the Grand Mufti, and the Grand Mufti's recruitment of uh, Muslim fighting formations on behalf of Nazi Germany, in particular Muslim SS units. And in looking at the Muslim SS, and the Muslim Brotherhood, the dominant Islamo-fascist organization, and the parent organization of all of the Islamic uh, militant organizations in the world today, we're going to take a look at the ontogenesis, so to speak, of Islamo-fascism and militant Islam, and we're going to take a look at how this ties in with the world today. During the latter part of the broadcast, we're going to take a look at links uh, between these elements of history and uh, insurgencies taking place now in Chechnya, elsewhere in the, the former Soviet Central Asian states. We're going to take a look at the links with Hamas, and we're going to take a look at uh, what is going on in the, in the Balkans, where uh, the Kosovo Liberation Army and uh, the Bosnian Muslim fighting formations have a direct heritage running back to the SS. And last but certainly not least, we're going to take a look at the Islamo-fascist slash al link to the Republican Party's ethnic outreach organization. We're going to take a look at Karl Rove's pivotal role in helping to establish the Grover Norquist link to the Al-Qaeda slash al taqwa milieu. And we're also going to take a look at the seminal role played by Talat Atman in the genesis of this uh, GOP ethnic al taqwa slash Islamo-fascist link. Talat Atman, a director of Harkin Energy, 
close ally of both George's Bush, uh, Harkin Energy being the uh, George Bush's uh, one of one of the younger George Bush's failed oil companies, and uh, Talat Otman also with a heritage going back to BCCI, uh, involved with people connected to the Nubian Hand Bank milieu. Talat Otman also interceded on behalf of the targets of the Operation Green Quest raids. Now, for much of the history of Islam under the swastika, we're going to take a look at a uh, very scholarly and very important document. This is on a Yugoslavian website, and I want to note that. It does have its its obvious ideological biases. Not uh, inaccurate under the circumstances, but it does have its bias. So I, I would note that there is a strong degree of correlation between this document titled Islam under the Swastika, the Grand Mufti and the Nazi Protectorate of Bosnia-Herzegovina, 1941-1945. to It's by Karl K. Savich, S-A-V-I-C-H. There's a strong degree of overlap between this and uh, Some Call It Peace by Yusef Badansky, a very conservative advisor to the United States Congress on counterterrorism. That book, which I've accessed in a number of programs in the past, most recently, for the record, 400, also has its ideological biases, but one of the things that's noteworthy about both books is that they are from the standpoint of military history, very scholarly, and there's a high degree of correlation. And uh, again, I believe that I've accurately handicapped both documents and showing the overlap between this very scholarly Yugoslavian website document and the very conservative uh, document that was authored by Yusef Badansky, some, some call it peace, uh, I think we can uh, draw a pretty clear picture of a very important piece of history that uh, is very much affecting the world today, and yet which has been largely eclipsed. Uh, the website on which this can be accessed is www.rastko.org.yu, R-A-S-T-K-O. Again, Islam under the swastika, the Grand Mufti and the Nazi Protectorate of Bosnia-Herzegovina, 1941-1945, to by Carl K. Savage, 2001. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, we're going to, uh, by the way, much of this document is uh, going to be focusing on Haj Amin Hosseini and his recruitment of Muslim Waffen SS units. And Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, uh, noted an aspect of militant Islam, which he found to be very, very useful for the recruitment of Muslims to SS fighting foundations, uh, fighting formations. And this is something which is at the foundation of uh, some of the uh, for events that we're seeing today. I would note under traditional Islam, committing suicide, even in battle, is a deep sin. It's one of the reasons why Islamo-fascism and Wahhabism and much of the, many of the manifestations of militant Islam that we're seeing today are actually heretical. But reading uh, from Heinrich Himmler's assessment of uh, Muslims as practical recruits to the SS, unlike most SS officials, Himmler was convinced of the fighting ability of the Bosnian Muslims, partly from his understanding of the role of the Bosnian Muslims as soldiers in the Austro-Hungarian Imperial Army before and during World War I, and his belief that Islam was an ideal religion for a soldier. Himmler stated to Josef Goebbels that he had, quote, nothing against Islam because it educates the men in this division for me and promises them heaven if they fight and are killed in action, a very practical and attractive religion for soldiers. And in Himmler's statement, we can see a very, very important uh, ideological uh, paradigm for the present. By the way, I would note that the Balkans, and much of what we're going to be looking at uh, in the, this paper is in the Balkans. The Balkans are an area that are, it's, it's far more complex than it's made out to be in the American media, which is saying very little. <laughs> Just about everything is more complex than it's made out to be in the American media. But in assessing uh, the Balkanization of the Balkans, so to speak, one should understand that it's an area that has traded hands for uh, various empires. It was for much of history uh, part of the Ottoman Turkish Empire, and then as the Ottoman Empire began to recede and disintegrate, the Austro-Hungarian Empire moved in. The Serbs were among the most effective and militant resistance to both the Ottoman Turks and to the Austro-Hungarians. In fact, it was uh, Serbian nationalists that uh, Serbian nationalism that helped to 
light the uh, match to the tinderbox that, of the Balkans that uh, precipitated World War I. But one should note in an attempting to suppress the Serbs, the Austro-Hungarians actually utilized Bosnian Muslim fighting formations to suppress the Serbs and to fight alongside them in World War I. As noted in that passage that I just mentioned, this was one of the things that Himmler sought to use. Islam under the Swastika by Carl K. Savage begins, The Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Hajamin al-Husseini. Hajamin al-Husseini arrived in Europe in 1941 following the unsuccessful pro-Nazi coup which he organized in Iraq. By the way, one of the uh, officers who was involved in that coup was Kairullah al-Tufa, Saddam Hussein's maternal uncle and political mentor, as we've looked at in numerous programs. Continuing. Husseini met with German Foreign Minister Joachim von Ribbentrop and was officially received by Adolf Hitler on November 28, 1941, in Berlin. Nazi Germany established for der Großmufti von Jerusalem a bureau from which he organized the following. 1. Radio propaganda on behalf of Nazi Germany. 2. Espionage and fifth column activities in Muslim regions of Europe and the Middle East. 3. The formation of Muslim Waffen-SS and Wehrmacht units in Bosnia-Herzegovina, kosovo metohja Western Macedonia, North Africa, and Nazi-occupied areas of the Soviet Union, and four, the formation of schools and training centers for Muslim imams and the mullahs who would accompany the Muslim SS and Wehrmacht units. As soon as he arrived in Europe, the Mufti established close contacts with Bosnian Muslim and Albanian Muslim leaders. He would spend the remainder of, remainder of the war organizing and rallying Muslims in support of Nazi Germany. By the way, I would note that uh, in uh, World War II, Albania was among those Eastern European countries that fought on the side of the Axis. It was originally occupied by fascist Italy and uh Albanian formations took part in the invasion of the Soviet Union. Skipping down in this article of Hajamin al-Husseini and his work on behalf of the Axis, and here there's discussion of the formation of the Muslim Brotherhood, the parent organization of Hamas, and an organization that we're going to look at uh, in connection with al-Taqwa and the links to the Republican Party later on in the broadcast. Hassan el Banna formed the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt in 1928. The Muslim Brotherhood had links to the Grand Mufti and worked with him in Palestine, sending volunteers in support of the Palestinian uprisings in 1936, 1939, and during the 1948 war. The Muslim Brotherhood sought to establish Muslim states based on the Sharia, Islamic law, and the caliphate system of political rule wherein each Islamic state would be ruled by a caliph. Islam is, quote, creed and state, book and sword, and a way of life, unquote. In Pakistan, Syed Abdul Allah Mududi formed the Jamaat Islam movement, Islami movement with the goal of establishing Muslim theocratic states based on Quranic law. Egyptian Syed Qutub of the Muslim Brotherhood continued the movement after World War II. The Muslim Brotherhood had offshoots the Egyptian Islamic Jihad, and Hamas. Hajamin al-Husseini, the Muslim Brotherhood, Jamaat Islami, Islamic Jihad, all form the roots and historical background for the emergence of the Al-Qaeda network, the Mujahideen of Afghanistan, and Osama bin Laden. Ayatollah Khomeini and Bosnian Muslim leader Ali Izzet Begovic would be influenced by the anti-secular, anti-Western, radical Muslim nationalist movements. In his book, The Islamic Declaration, Islamska Declarisha, or 1970, Izet Begovic rejected the secular conception of an Islamic state espoused by Kamal Ataturk. Izet Begovic sought to create an Islamic state based on the Sharia, a state where religion would not be separate from the state, i.e., an Islamic theocratic state. Izet Begovic established close links to Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda and invited Mujahideen forces to join the Bosnian Muslim army. Izet Begovic later would give Osama bin Laden a special Bosnian passport and the Mujahideen freedom fighters would receive Bosnian citizenship and passports. 
One of the hijackers of the second attack on the World Trade Center on September 11, 2001, possessed a Bosnian passport. Yasser Arafat was introduced to the Mufti, and the Mufti would subsequently become the role model and mentor for Yasser Arafat. In biographies of Arafat, whose real name is Muhammad al-Husseini, the Mufti is stated to be a distant relative of Arafat, although this claim has been denied as well. For two years, beginning at the age of 16, Arafat worked for the Mufti and his covert terrorist network and organization, helping to smuggle and buy weapons in the war against Jewish settlers of Palestine. Sheikh Hassan Abu Saud, the Mufti of al-Sharifia, of al-Shafaria, also worked with the Mufti. The Grand Mufti was a precursor of both the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, and of the Palestinian National Struggle, and the movement to maintain a Palestinian state. The terrorism, fanaticism, and ruthlessness of that movement today reflect the enduring legacy and influence of the Grand Mufti. By the way, I would note that uh, from a military standpoint, uh, Yasser Arafat was also a protege of and associate of Otto Skorzeny, the head of the Odessa, the man who was in charge of Hitler's commando training, and the Skorzeny Yasser Arafat connection was formed while Skorzeny was working on contract for the Galen organization and the CIA in the early 1950s. Continuing and skipping down, in 1939, the Mufti established his headquarters in Baghdad, Iraq, where he set up a political department that maintained ties to Germany and Italy. Germany sought to create a Berlin-Baghdad axis and instigated a pro-Nazi coup. Iraqi General Rashid Ali al-Gailani, a militant Muslim nationalist, and the Golden Square, a group of pro-Nazi Iraqi officers, took over the Iraqi government. The Mufti sent representatives to Berlin and a letter to Adolf Hitler. In a reply by German State Secretary Freiherr von Feisacher, the Mufti was told that, quote, The Fuhrer received your letter dated January 20th. He took great interest in what you wrote him about the national struggle of the Arabs. Germany is ready to cooperate with you and to give you all possible military and financial help. Germany is prepared to deliver to you immediately military material, unquote. Obver, German intelligence, established contacts with the Mufti at this time. And again, note that uh, one of the uh, officers who assisted in the failed coup that we're about to hear about, again, was Saddam Hussein's maternal uncle and political mentor, Kairullah al tufa Note that uh, Yusef Nada also uh, uh, allegedly worked for the Obver, the head of uh, al Taqwa or Nada Management. And we'll, uh, we'll deal with the, we'll review some of the links between the al taqwa milieu and the Republican Party in the Bush administration later in the broadcast. Continuing. Nazi Germany sent arms and aircraft to the Mufti, Mufti's forces in Iraq, but the British were able to reoccupy Iraq, forcing the Mufti and al-Gailani to flee to Tehran. The Mufti then flew to either Afghanistan or Turkey, where he is known to have many friends, unquote. From there, he arrived in Albania, and on October 24th, he reached southern Italy. On October 27th, 1941, the Mufti arrived in Rome. The Mufti would subsequently play a major role in organizing Muslim support for Nazism in Europe. On May 9th, 1941, the Mufti broadcast a fatwa announcing a jihad, an Islamic holy war against Britain, and he urged every Muslim to join in the struggle against the, quote, greatest foe of Islam, unquote. Quote, I invite all my Muslim brothers throughout the whole world to join in the holy war for Allah, to preserve Islam, your independence, and your lands from English aggression, unquote. The Mufti envisioned a vast Arab-Muslim un union which would unite Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Syria, Palestine, Transjordan and Egypt with Germany and Italy, creating a pan-Muslim Arab bloc of countries. Parenthetically, I would note that this dovetailed, uh, th this is the uh, embodiment of the Third Reich's plan for allying with the Muslim peoples in order to gain uh, control of the Earth Island and the world's petroleum resources. Skipping down. 
Franz Reichert, the director of the Palestine branch of the Deutsche Nachrichten Bureau, or German News Bureau, from 1933 to 1938, established the first contacts between Nazi Germany and Muslim leaders in the Middle East. The Mufti approached representatives of the Nazi regime and sought cooperation on July 21, 1937, when he visited the German consul in Jerusalem. He later sent an agent and personal representative to Berlin for discussions with Nazi leaders. SS Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich was second in command to Heinrich Himmler in the SS hierarchy and was the chief of the Reich Sicherheitshauptamt, or RSHA, and was the head of the Sicherheitsdienst, or SD, the SS Security Service. In September of 1937, Heydrich sent two SS officers, SS Hauptscharfuhrer Adolf Eichmann and SS Oberscharfuhrer Herbert Hagen on a mission to Palestine, one of the main objectives being to establish contact with the Grand Mufti. During this period, Husseini received financial and military aid and supplies from Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. I would note that uh, Adolf Eichmann's superior and the man who succeeded him as the top SS uh, espionage contact in the Middle East and with the Grand Mufti was Otto von Bolschwing, who was later brought to the United States by Alan Dulles uh, and went to work for the CIA. It was Otto von Bolschwing's protege, Helena von Damm, who selected all of the lists from which Ronald Reagan made his cabinet appointments and the vast majority of people who are serving the current administration of George Bush have a curriculum vitae going back to the original uh, Fondam selectees. Continuing, after meeting Hitler and Ribbentrop in Berlin in 1941, the Mufti was approached by Gottlob Berger, head of the SS main office in charge of recruiting, and by Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, who made him a part of the SS apparatus. In May of 1943, the Mufti was moved to the SS main office, where he participated in the recruiting of Muslims in the Balkans, the USSR, the Middle East, and North Africa. The Grand Mufti was instrumental in the organization and formation of many Muslim units and formations in the Waffen-SS and Wehrmacht. Hundreds of thousands of Muslims fought for Nazi Germany in the following formations and units. Two Bosnian Muslim Waffen-SS divisions, the 13th Waffen-SS or Hanjar and the 23rd Waffen-SS or Kama division, an Albanian Waffen-SS division in Kosovo, Metoja and Western Macedonia, that was the 21st Waffen-Gebergs division der SS or Skanderbeg, uh, composed, by the way, largely of ethnic Albanians from Kosovo, continuing, a Muslim SS self-defense regiment in the Rashko or Sanjak region of Serbia, the Arab Legion or Arabisha Freiheits, Freiheits Corps, the Arab Brigade, the Ostmuslimanische SS regiment, the Ost-Turkish and Waffenverbander SS made up of Turkestanis, note the following in particular, the Waffengruppe der SS Krim, formations consisting of Chechen Muslims from Chechnya, and a Tatar regiment der SS made up of Crimean Tatars, and other Muslim formations in the Waffen SS and Wehrmacht, in Bosnia Herzegovina, the Balkans, North Africa, Nazi occupied areas of the Soviet Union and the Middle East. And uh, note again uh, the heritage of many of these units, continuing and skipping down. What. Uh, uh, Savage talks about next is the collaboration between many of the Muslim uh, SS recruits and fascist recruits from Bosnia with the brutal Croatian regime, uh, which had uh, to a large extent a Catholic uh, ethnic derivation. By the way, the Neo-Ustashi and the Neo-Hanjar, the Neo-Ustashi in Croatia and the Neo-Hanjar is the coined term in Bosnia, had much to do with the destabilization of the former Yugoslavia and uh, those elements are very much present in the new, quote, independent, unquote, Croatia, and in the new, quote, independent, unquote, Bosnia-Herzegovina, both of which are, in effect, satellite states of Germany. Continuing. In 1941, over 100,000 Bosnian Muslim conscripts were available to fight in the military formations of the Third Reich. Roman Catholic Croatian and Bosnian Muslim soldiers when they were in the Ustasha death squads the Domobranci, or Home Guards, and the Croatian Army. 
Bosnian Muslim soldiers were in the Nazi Ustisha German Croatian Legion units, the 369th, 373rd, and 392nd Infantry Divisions. The 369th German Croatian Infantry Division, formed in 1942, was known as the Vraja Divizia, or Devil Division, commanded by General Lieutenant Fritz Neidholt. The 373rd German Croatian Infantry Division was known as the Tigar Divizia, or Tiger Division. The 392nd German Croatian Infantry Division was known as the Plava Divizia, or Blue Division. The 369th Reinforced Croat Infantry Regiment, made up of Croats and Bosnian Muslims, fought at Stalingrad, where it was destroyed. The NVH also sent the Italian Croat Legion, attached to the Italian 3rd Mobile Division, to the Russian Front, where it too was destroyed during the Don Retreat. The 369th Reinforced Infantry Regiment, formed at Varajdin, consisted of three battalions, two from Croatia, one from Sarajevo. The regiment left Zagreb on July 15, 1941, for the Dolorsheim training camp near Vienna, Austria. From here, the troops were transferred by railroad to the USSR. The regiment was deployed on various points on the Russian front, Kremenchug, Jazi, Kirovograd, Permomaisk, Poltava, the Dnieper River, Kharkov, and Stadino. On May 15, 1942, the regiment was deployed on the Voronezh front. On September 27, the Bosnian Muslim Croat troops deployed to Stalingrad, where they fought to take the city. By February of 1943, the regiment was totally annihilated and obliterated by the Russian Red Army. The German Axis forces were encircled and surrendered en masse in Stalingrad. And we're going to continue with this history of Islam under the swastika, and in particular uh, SS formations from uh, the Muslim population of the Earth Island in the second half of this broadcast. And we're going to tie this in with the things as disparate as the uh, Palestinian-Israeli confrontation, uh, conflicts currently taking place in the former Soviet Union, the Mudi Balkans, and last but certainly not least, the Muslim Brotherhood links going to the Republican Party and the Bush administration. But that will be inside two of the broadcast. WFMU is archiving the For the Record programs on real audio. WFMU.org front slash Dave Emery has more recent programs streaming. Older shows available for download only at a longer URL linked to both the WFMU.org front slash Dave Emery website and to the Spitfire website at spitfirelist.com. Within a week or so of the airing of this broadcast, there will be a detailed, article-length, annotated description of For the Record 414 in the For the Record section of the Spitfire website at spitfirelist.com. That concludes Side 1 of For the Record program number 414, Islam under the Swastika and its Implications for Today, being recorded on June 16th of the year 2003. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is Side 2 of For the Record program 414, Islam under the swastika and its implications for today being recorded on June 16th of 2003. WFMU is archiving the For the Record programs on real audio. More recent programs streaming at WFMU.org front slash Dave Emery. Older shows for download only at a longer URL linked to both that address and to the SpitfireList.com website. And in the For the Record section of SpitfireList.com, there will be a detailed, annotated, article-length description of For the Record Program 414 within a week or so of the airing of this program. We're going to go right back to the uh, paper from which I was reading for much of Side 1. It's authored by Carl K. Savage. It's available on a Yugoslavian website. It has its ideological biases, but it's well-documented, very scholarly, and dovetails with many conservative U.S. sources that have talked about the Balkans conflict and some of the fascist heritage of some of the uh, fighting units there. Islam under the swastika, the Grand Mufti and the Nazi Protectorate of Bosnia-Herzegovina, 1941-1945, to by Carl K. Savage, 2001. Of some of the Bosnian Muslim Axis fighting formations, 
The Bosnian Muslims formed purely Muslim formations as well, the most important of which was the Muslim Volunteer Legion led by Mohammed Hatshepsut. Other Muslim formations were the Zeleni Kadar or Kader or Green Cadre, parenthetically I would add green is the sacred color of Islam, Nazi formations created by deserters from the Home Guards or Domobranchi led by Nashad Topchich, the Muslim nationalist group, the Young Muslims or Maladi Muslimani, Hus Huska Milkovic's Muslim Army, and the Garajdi Foka Militias or Policing Units. Bosnian President Ali Zetbegovic was a key member of the Young Muslims or Maladi Muslimani group. I would add that uh, as we've looked at in a number of For the Record programs, including 293 and 330, he uh, also had recruited for 13th Waffen SS or Hanjar, appointed a veteran of that division to be his first deputy defense minister, and uh, was also uh, a, uh, had named the uh, uh, top unit, arguably, of the new Bosnian army after the Hanjar unit. Skipping down. Himmler wanted to reestablish the continuity with the Austro-Hungarian Habsburg Empire, which had formed Bosnian Muslim military formations. Himmler sent the Mufti to Zagreb and to Sarajevo to prepare for the formation of the Bosnian Muslim units. Himmler's SS representative in the NDH, that was the Croatian uh, Ustashi regime, Konstantin Kammerhofer, was told to begin recruiting a Bosnian Muslim Waffen SS division of 26,000 men, which, if realized, would make it the largest of all the SS divisions. In forming the Bosnian Muslim Waffen SS division, Himmler overruled the objections of the Pavlic regime, which considered such formations an infringement on the sovereignty of the NDH. Himmler, as the second most powerful leader in the Third Reich after Hitler, was able to create a de facto protectorate for Bosnia. He wanted to create an SS recruiting zone, an SS state administration in northeastern Bosnia to restore order, unquote. Two Bosnian Muslim Waffen SS divisions would be created by 1944 to serve this purpose. Now more about the creation of these divisions, the uh, 21st and 23rd, or the 13th and 23rd Waffen SS, later an Albanian Muslim division, the 21st Waffen SS or Skanderbeg division, a predecessor of the modern day Kosovo Liberation Army was created as well. Skipping down. In April of 1943, the Grand Mufti came to Sarajevo, where he was greeted by cheering crowds and where he was photographed on the balcony of the Presidency Building with Bosnian Muslim leaders to organize the formation of the Muslim SS Division. Skipping down. In April of 1943, the Grand Mufti came to Sarajevo, where he was greeted by cheering crowds and where he was photographed on the balcony of the Presidency Building with Bosnian Muslim leaders to organize the formation of the Muslim SS Divisions. The Bosnian Muslims formed two Nazi SS divisions during World War II, the 13th Waffen Gebirgs Division der SS Hanjar, or Hanchar in German, from the Turkish Hanchar Dagger, from Arabic Kangar, or Dagger, and the 23rd Waffen Gebirgs Division der SS Kama, from the Turkish Kama, meaning Dagger, Dagger, or Dirk, unquote. Note that both the Hanjar and Kama have the same uh, Turkish and Arabic derivations for dagger, and uh, the explanation for that name will be uh, contained in the context of what is to follow. Bear in mind the Austro-Hungarian Empire's use of uh, police, uh, Muslim police, from the former Ottoman Empire and soldiers from the former Ottoman Empire to suppress the Serbs who resisted both the Ottoman Turks and the Austro-Hungarians. During the war, Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler, the architect of the Holocaust, reviewed the Hanjar division in a German newsreel in 1943 while the division was being formed and trained in Silesia at the Neuhammer Waffen SS training camp in Germany. The Bosnian Muslims had approximately 20 to 25,000 men in the Waffen SS and police, roughly 4% of their total population one of the highest ratios of membership in the Nazi ranks as a percentage of total population during the war. Skipping down again. The Muslim Hanjar and Kama divisions were organized on the model of the Bosnian Muslim regiments of the Austro-Hungarian army. The divisional names are derived from the Turkish words 
hançer and kama, which in Turkish mean dagger, and were symbolic of Islam and Islamic military and political power in the Islamic State. The Turkish word hançer is derived from the Arabic word kangar or dagger. The hanjar and kama were usually curved Turkish daggers, which the Muslim Ottoman Turkish zaptiyas or police customarily carried as weapons when Bosnia was under Turkish Ottoman rule. Thus, the names of the divisions were meant to revive the Islamic historical traditions of the Bosnian Muslims as the rulers and masters, begs or agas of Bosnia-Herzegovina over the non-Muslim raya or untermenschen or mistmenschen, the subhumans, Orthodox Serb Christians, Jews, and Roma or Gypsies. This was the meaning and symbolic significance of the names Hanjar and Kama. Usually, the Waffen SS divisions were named after heroic local political or military leaders, but the Bosnian Muslims lack any historical figures in their history. There then follows a section in which he names uh, some of the other names under which uh, the 13th Waffen SS was originally uh, classified. I'm going to skip that, and I'm going to uh, jump briefly to the present. And this is an article from the Daily Telegraph of London by Robert Fox in Fojnica in Bosnia, December 29, 1993. Albanians and Afghans fight for the heirs to Bosnia's SS past. Documents, shouted a man in a beret with an insignia in green Arabic script outside the UN house in the Bosnian mountain town of Fujnika. He was hostile and demanded our presence at the police station. Later, the police chief apologized, but made clear that the authority had passed to the men with the Quranic texts hanging from their fatigues. Last summer, Muslim and Croat leaders in Fujnika asked the UN to declare it a zone of peace, unquote. Since then, war has ravaged the town, bringing murder, mayhem, and exile to at least half its original population of 12,000. Different and alien forces are now in charge, some of the toughest in the Bosnian Muslim army. These are the men of the Hanjar division. Quote, We do everything with the knife and we always fight on the front line, a Hanjar told one UN officer. Up to 6,000 strong, the Hanjar division glories in a fascist culture. They see themselves as the heirs of the SS Hanjar division formed by Bosnian Muslims in 1943 to fight for the Nazis. Their spiritual model was Mohammed Amin al-Hussein, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who sided with Hitler. According to UN officers, surprisingly few of those in charge of the Hanjars in Fojnica seem to speak good Serbo-Croatian. Quote, Many of them are Albanian, whether from Kosovo, the Serb province where Albanians are the majority, or from Albania itself, unquote. They are trained and led by veterans from Afghanistan and Pakistan, say UN sources. The strong presence of native Albanians is an ominous sign. It could mean the seeds of war are spreading south via Kosovo and into Albania, thence to the Albanians of Macedonia. Pakistani fundamentalists are known to have had a strong hand in providing arms and a small weapons industry for the Bosnian Muslims. Skipping down. Most significant, most, more significant is the nature of the Hanjars and the influence of the Albanians in their command and the support from Pakistan. These suggest politically and militarily that the war in Bosnia has spread under the dozing eyes of the West. This, by the way, was 1993. As noted in other broadcasts, not only was uh, Alija Edzet Begovic, the first president of Bosnia, a member of the Young Muslims and a recruiter for the Hanjar division, but his first deputy defense minister, Ochan Osan Cengic, was also a veteran of the Hanjar division, and Hanjar was engaged in force projection into uh, western Macedonia and Kosovo, and the Kosovo Liberation Army, uh, were in many cases, many of the combatants in the KLA were the sons and grandsons of people who had fought in the 21st Waffen-SS or Skanderbeg division. And as we're going to see as we detail some of the history, the initial formation of the recruitment of the 21st Waffen-SS uh, in many ways uh, mirrors some of the formation of the KLA. And for the record, 168 and 293, among other programs, 
I noted that, uh, in a sense, the KLA could be considered either Skanderbeg II or Hanjar III. And as we're going to see, the uh, uh, breaking off or the uh, recruitment and the subdivision of people from 13th SS into the 21st Waffen SS was mirrored in the modern period. Skipping down, speaking of the Hanjar division, this is, by the way, the World War II Hanjar division, the division had at least nine Bosnian Muslim officers, the highest ranking of whom was SS Obersturmbannführer Hussein Bishevich Beg, who had been a Muslim officer in the Austro-Hungarian army when Bosnia was under occupation. Initially, the Hanjar division was formed around the core of the Muslim Volunteer Legion led by Mohammed Haji Fendic, which was close to divisional strength in and of itself. There were approximately 300 Albanian Muslim troops in the Hanjar division, primarily from Kosovo Metohija in Regiment 28 and I-28. These Albanian Muslims would in 1944 be transferred to the 21st Waffen Gebirgs Division or Skanderbeg to occupy Kosovo and Western Macedonia. Albanian Muslim squad leader Nazir Hodic was a prominent member of Hanjar. Albanian Muslim Ajdin Mamutovic was 17 when he joined the Hanjar SS division. Quote, I was only 17 years old when I joined the SS. I found the physical training to be quite easy. There then follows discussion of the formation of the 23rd Waffen SS or Kama division. Uh, like Skanderbeg, it really was not of any great military significance, but it was of great political significance for in many ways these were organizations which went underground to a certain extent with the Third Reich and which also formed allegiances with militant uh, Muslims such as the Wahhabi sect fueled by the tremendous oil wealth of Saudi Arabia. The Wahhabis themselves had a significant overlap with fascism in the World War II and pre-World War II period. And uh, so again, the, 20, the 21st and 23rd Waffen SS, like the uh, Waffengruppe der SS Krim, composed of uh, Chechen Muslims, are of historical significance and are reflective of events that are going on today. Skipping down in this paper, in January of 1944, the Mufti made a second visit to and spent three days with the Hanjar division, which was departing from Germany for Bosnia by rail. In a speech to the division, he made the following declaration of principles, which was to guide not only Bosnian Muslims, but all Muslims throughout the world. This division of Bosnian Muslims, established with the help of Greater Germany, is an example to Muslims in all countries. There is no other deliverance for them from imperialistic oppression than hard fighting to preserve their homes and faith. Many common interests exist between the Islamic world and Greater Germany, and those make cooperation a matter of course. The Reich is fighting against the same enemies who rob the Muslims of their countries and suppress their faith in Asia, Africa, and Europe. Germany is the only great power which has never attacked an Islamic country. Further, National Socialist Germany is fighting against world Jewry. The Quran says, you will find that the Jews are the worst enemies of the Muslims, unquote. There are also considerable similarities between Islamic principles and those of National Socialism, namely in the affirmation of struggle and fellowship, in stressing leadership, in the idea of order, in the high valuation of work. All this brings our ideologies close together and facilitates cooperation. I am happy to see in this division a visible and practical expression of both ideologies. Husseini referred to the Bosnian Muslims as the cream of Islam, unquote, and in a speech to the Imams in the Hanzar division explained why the Muslim and Arab world should support the Axis in Nazi Germany. Friendship and collaboration between two peoples must be built on a firm foundation. The necessary ingredients are common spiritual and material interests as well as the same ideals. The relationship between the Muslims and the Germans is built on this foundation. Never in its history has Germany attacked a Muslim nation. Germany battles world Jewry, Islam's principal enemy. Germany also battles England and its allies who have persecuted millions of Muslims as well as Bolshevism, Bolshevism which subjugates 40 million Muslims and threatens the Islamic faith in other lands. 
Any one of these arguments would be enough of a foundation for a friendly relationship between two peoples. My enemy's enemy is my friend, unquote. And skipping down again, uh, yet another uh, archetype which can be seen, uh, uh, and one should not misunderstand militant Islam as an outgrowth of uh, fascism and Nazi Germany, but rather that militant Islam, as uh, conceptualized in the Mufti speech there, uh, allied with Nazi Germany and the Axis uh, to uh, basically assist them in uh, the control of the Earth Island, and that when the Third Reich went underground, many of those geopolitical and political alignments remained intact, skipping down. On March 4th, 1944, the Mufti attacked American policy in the Middle East in a radio broadcast from Berlin. No one ever thought that 140 million Americans would become tools in Jewish hands. How would the Americans dare to Judaize Palestine? The wicked American intentions toward the Arabs are now clear and there remain no doubts that they are endeavoring to establish a Jewish empire in the Arab world. The Donau Zeitung, or Danube Times newspaper of December 31, 1942, reported that the Mufti had donated over 240,000 kuna, the currency of the Ustashi regime, to the Muslim charity organization in Sarajevo from German government sources. Himmler donated 100,000 Reichsmarks. The SS bought clothing which was donated to the Mohammed Vilfaga Organisation, a Muslim charity. So uh, the archetype of using Muslim charities, and the, the principle of zakat or charity is inherent in Islam, but misusing those as vehicles for Islamo-fascism is also present uh, as an archetype in Islam under the swastika. Now again, there may be people wondering, so what? That was a long time ago. Well, it wasn't necessarily all that long ago. Uh, note, as discussed in uh, a number of broadcasts dealing with the Balkans Wars, that not only was the SS Hanjar basically recapitulated under Alia Ezet Begovic, himself a recruiter for that, Osan Chengich, his first deputy defense minister, was a veteran of uh, Hanjar, and I would also note that uh, the 21st Waffen SS, as I noted in For the Record 168, 293, and 330, the 21st Waffen SS, or Skanderbeg Division, uh, was composed of Albanian Muslims, many of them from Kosovo, and that many of the fighters in the Kosovo Liberation Army were the sons and grandsons of Skanderbeg veterans. And I speculated when noting that Hanjar II was engaged in force projection into the Kosovo Macedonia area and that it was sort of a special forces unit. I speculated that uh, that might be either, uh, that the KLA could either be considered Skanderbeg II or Hanjar III. And uh, that's discussed and, and uh, annotated in for the record 293 and 330, among other programs. Well, let's uh, jump to the present. Uh, from For the Record 293, uh, there are some interesting elements of the recapitulation of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, noting, among other things, Otto von Habsburg, a, a delegate to the European Parliament, and someone who was uh, an advocate of the Freedom for Rudolf Hess Committee, and also noting that Otto's son, Karl, reading from the description for For the Record Program 293, this in the SpitfireList.com website. Otto's son, Karl von Habsburg, married Francesca thyssen bornemisza the daughter of Heinrich thyssen bornemisza and uh, that uh, is available at a genealogical website. And noting the next point of information, Heinrich thyssen bornemisza is an heir to the Thyssen interests, in turn, a principal element of the Bormann organization. The economic and political component of a Third Reich gone underground, the Bormann organization controls corporate Germany and much of the rest of the world. And uh, I would note uh, that the uh, thyssen bornemisza Empire was the branch of the, the, the thyssen bornemisza branch of the Thyssen Industrial Empire was the source for much of the Bush family's economic largesse, and as recently as 1996, a Dutch journalist investigating this died under very strange circumstances. For the record, program 270, 248, 273, and 370 deal with the Bush family connections to the thyssen bornemisza Empire. Now again, jumping to the present and taking a look at some of the uh, tendrils, some of the tentacles that have come forward, 
New York Times, June 15, 2003, article by Dexter Filkins. Now, bear in mind the Waffen Gruppe der SS Krim, composed of Chechen Muslims. Those same geopolitical considerations have evolved into the present, and I've noted Saudi-slash-Wahhabi-slash-Al-Qaeda support for Chechen fighters in the past, and that's quite well documented at this point. U.S. Entangled in Mystery of Georgia's Islamic Fighters For months, local residents say the group of 15 Arab and Central Asian fighters lived quietly in a two-story house here among the hundreds of guerrillas who had turned this wooded vale near the Russian border into a burgeoning center of Islamic militancy. Like many of those who gathered here, the fighters had come over the snowy passes from Chechnya, where they had been helping their fellow Muslims in their struggle to break with the Russian Republic. They exercised to stay in shape and went into the woods to practice shooting. Some of the militants departed, presumably for Russia, while new ones came to prepare for the fight. And Wahhabi, uh, Muslim Brotherhood, and al taqwa links to the Chechen fighters, uh, very well documented at this point and discussed, and among other programs, for the record 341 and 381. BBC News from June 9, 2003. Russia arrests Islamist suspects, reads in part. Security officers also seized 500 grams of plastic explosives, several hand grenades, and leaflets for the organization Hizub e Tahrir. These are terrorists who want to overthrow the existing regime by military means, FSB spokesman Sergei Ignatenchko told Russia's NTV television. Hizub al Tabir discussed in For the Record 395. This from the South Florida Sun Sentinel, Germany bans Islamic group it says is anti-Semitic, a Reuters story. Hizub Ut Tahrir became well known in Germany after staging a rally at Berlin's Technical University in October at which the main speakers made anti-American comments. Members of Germany's extreme right-wing NPD, a party the government is trying to ban, also attended the rally, he said. Among the uh, NPD uh, associates, Horst Mahler, and Ahmed Huber of al Taqwa. Turning to the Chronicle of June 14th of 2003, article by Danielle Haas, Hamas committed to armed struggle against Israel, skipping down, Hamas, an acronym for Harakat Muqwama Islamia, or the Islamic Resistance Movement, was born in 1987 as an outgrowth of the Palestinian branch of the Muslim Brotherhood. And again, the fascist antecedents of that we have looked at many times in the past. We've looked at Christian Gansharski, a Polish-born German citizen who converted to Islam from the LA Times of June 12th. Sebastian Rotella writes, terror suspect called key Al-Qaeda leader, skipping down. The other converts aren't even on the radar screen compared to him, said Matthew Levitt, a former FBI counterterrorism analyst and a senior fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. He is the most interesting convert hands down, and I think he's one of the most interesting captures, unquote. And uh, reading of uh, Gansharsky, Gansharsky is a veteran of Al-Qaeda's Afghan training camps and saw combat in Bosnia, Herzegovina, according to French Interior Minister Sarkozy. And last but certainly not least, in addition to the mysterious Mr. Gansharsky, who appears to have been uh, aided to a certain extent, at least in, pra in, in uh, practice, by both German and Saudi authorities, turning to the Wall Street Journal of June 11th of 2003. This is an article by Tom Hamburger and Glenn R. Simpson. In difficult times, Muslims count on an unlikely advocate. In early 1997, Grover Norquist, a prominent conservative activist, met with Re Republican political sultan Karl Rove at an awkward time, skipping down. That brief conversation in Austin, Texas, helped start a new chapter in Mr. Norquist's career and in the political lives of Muslims in this country. The following year, Mr. Norquist started the nonprofit Islamic Free Institute. In collaboration with Mr. Rove, now Mr. Bush's chief political advisor, he and other institute leaders courted Muslim voters for the 2000 presidential campaign. Mr. Norquist even credits gains among Muslims with putting Mr. Bush in a position to win the critical Florida contest. And among the principal directors of this Rove-slash-Bush uh, organization, 
To run the nonprofit's day-to-day operations, Mr. Norquist turned to Khalid Safuri, a Palestinian-American raised in Kuwait who had been an official of the American Muslim Council, a political group in Washington. The Institute's founding chairman was a Palestinian-American, Talat Otman, who had served with Mr. Bush on the board of Harkin Energy Corporation and later visited the president in the White House, according to records obtained by the National Security News Service. Now, this article is heavily spun, but as noted in uh, Wall Street Journal articles from March 22nd of the year 2002, And from April 18th of 2002, there are profound overlaps between this, uh, the organizations implicated in the Republican Ethnic Outreach Organization, and again, Mr. Uh, Norquist's and uh, Safuri's Islamic Institute, have interlocking directorates and overlapping addresses and financial arrangements with many powerful organizations linked not only to Talat Otman, but also to Al-Taqwa and the Muslim Brotherhood. The Washington Post of October 7th of 2002 has another very, very good article that uh, I excerpted in, for the record, 382. The uh, of texts for these various uh, references are in the uh, descriptions for, for the record, 356 and 357, and 382, and I will reproduce those texts in the, to those text excerpts in the description for, for the record, program 414. For when we look at Islam under the swastika, it goes directly forward to the Republican Ethnic Outreach Organization, and I suspect that that uh, is reflective of the closing stages of the Cold War in which Islamic elements, including Muslim Brotherhood and Al-Qaeda antecedents in Afghanistan, were used for the Cold War, and uh, all of which is to say that uh, Islam under the swastika has profound implications for today. This concludes for the record 414, side 2, being recorded on June 16th of 2003. My name is Dave Emery. Thanks for listening. Dansky, some, day, some call it peace. Uh, I think we can uh, draw a pretty clear picture of a very important piece of history that uh, is very much affecting the world today, and yet which has been largely eclipsed. Uh, The website on which this can be accessed is www.rastko.org.yu, R-A-S-T-K-O. Again, Islam under the swastika, the Grand Mufti and the Nazi Protectorate of Bosnia-Herzegovina, 1941-1945, to by Carl K. Savage, 2001. Uh, by way of introduction, uh, we're going to, uh, by the way, much of this document is uh, going to be focusing on Haj Amin Hosseini and his recruitment of Muslim Waffen-SS units. And Heinrich Himmler, the head of the SS, uh, noted an aspect of militant Islam, which he found to be very, very useful for the recruitment of Muslims to SS fighting foundations, uh, fighting formations. And this is something which is at the foundation of uh, some of the uh, the events that we're seeing today. I would note under traditional Islam, committing suicide, even in battle, is a deep sin. It's one of the reasons why Islamofascism and Wahhabism and much of the, many of the manifestations of militant Islam that we're seeing today are actually heretical. But reading, uh, from Heinrich Himmler's assessment of, uh, Muslims as practical recruits to the SS, unlike most SS officials, Himmler was convinced of the fighting ability of the Bosnian Muslims, partly from his understanding of the role of the Bosnian Muslims as soldiers in the Austro-Hungarian... Hello, my name is Dave Emery, and this is side one of For the Record program number 414, titled, Islam under the Swastika and its Implications for Today. This is being recorded on June 16th of the year 2003. Remember Spitfire, spitfirelist.com is their website. It's equipped with real audio, and within a week or so of the airing of this broadcast, there will be a detailed article-length description of For the Record Program 414, meticulously annotated in the For the Record section of the Spitfire website. Note that sister station WFMU-FM is archiving the For the Record programs on real audio. More recent programs are streaming at wfmu.org front slash Dave Emery. 
Older programs available for download only on Real Audio at a longer URL linked to both the spitfirelist.com website and to the wfmu.org front slash Dave Emery website. And again, a big tip of the hat to WFMU right across the river from Ground Zero. Uh, thanks to them, the whole For the Record series for all intents and purposes is available for free online. Now, to the subject of this broadcast, what we're going to be doing is taking a look first at some of the history of the collaboration between Islam, or elements of it, Islam would be a better way of putting it. Uh, part of this is the derivation of Islamo-fascism, not to be uh, misunderstood as characterizing Islam as fascist, but there's a very information on behalf of Nazi Germany, in particular Muslim SS units. And in looking at the Muslim SS and the Muslim Brotherhood, the dominant Islamo-fascist organization and the parent organization of all of the Islamic uh, militant organizations in the world today, we're going to take a look at the ontogenesis, so to speak, of Islamo-fascism and militant Islam, and we're going to take a look at how this ties in with the world today. During the latter part of the broadcast, we're going to take a look at links uh, between these elements of history and uh, insurgencies taking place now in Chechnya, elsewhere in the, the former Soviet Central Asian states. We're going to take a look at the links with Hamas, and we're going to take a look at uh, what is going on in the, in the Balkans, where uh, the Kosovo Liberation Army and uh, the Bosnian Muslim fighting formations have a direct heritage running back to the SS. And last but certainly not least, we're going to take a look at the Islamo-fascist slash al link to the Republican Party's ethnic outreach organization. We're going to take a look at Karl Rove's pivotal role in helping to establish the Grover Norquist link to the Al-Qaeda slash al taqwa milieu. And we're also going to take a look at the seminal role played by Talat Otman in the genesis of this uh, GOP ethnic al taqwa slash Islamo-fascist link. Talat Otman, a director of Harkin Energy, close ally of both George's Bush, uh, Harkin Energy being the uh, George Bush important element both of fascism and of Islam that dovetail, and uh, it is uh, a, an Islamic manifestation of fascism. We're going to be taking a look at Haj Amin al-Husseini, one of the most important figures in the history of fascism and in the development of Islamo-fascism, and we're going to be taking a look at the concept, once again, of the Earth Island, as the German geopoliticians called it, the stretch of land from the Straits of Gibraltar all the way across Europe, the Middle East, uh, the former Soviet Union, the Balkans, China, India, and uh, what is today Pakistan. It's one giant stretch of land with most of the world's land mass, most of the world's population, and most importantly, most of the world's oil. And across the middle of it is a vast stretch of largely Muslim population. In terms of their goals for world domination, the Third Reich looked to uh, ally with these elements of Muslim population in order to conquer the world and also to, uh, and, and in so doing, to cast the British and French out of the Middle East as uh, the colonial occupiers that they were and to uh, annex much of the former Soviet Union, much of which was Muslim, and also to annihilate world Jewry. Today, Islamo-fascism is a very important element of what I call the underground Reich. And what I hope to do in this broadcast is to detail some of the history of Islamo-fascism, in particular the Grand Mufti, and the Grand Mufti's recruitment of uh, Muslim fighting bushes, uh, one, of, one of the younger George Bush's failed oil companies, and uh, Talat Otman also with a heritage going back to BCCI. Uh, involved with people connected to the Nugan Hand Bank milieu, Talat Otman also interceded on behalf of the targets of the Operation Green Quest raids. Now, for much of the history of Islam under the swastika, we're going to take a look at a uh, very scholarly and very important document. This is on a Yugoslavian website, and I want to note that it does have its its obvious ideological biases. Not uh, inaccurate under the circumstances, but it does have its bias. Uh, I, I would note 
that there is a strong degree of correlation between this document titled Islam under the Swastika, the Grand Mufti and the Nazi Protectorate of Bosnia-Herzegovina, 1941 to 1945. It's by Carl K. Savage, S-A-V-I-C-H. There's a strong degree of overlap between this and uh, Some Call It Peace by Yusef Badansky, a very conservative advisor to the United States Congress on counterterrorism. That book, which I've accessed in a number of programs in the past, most recently, for the record, 400, also has its ideological biases, but one of the things that's noteworthy about both books is that they are from the standpoint of military history, very scholarly, and there's a high degree of correlation. And uh, again, I believe that I've accurately handicapped both documents and showing the overlap between this very scholarly Yugoslavian website document and the very conservative uh, document that was authored by Yusef.